The phone conversation between fantasy veterans Bob Harris and Matt Waldman is a quick and dirty rundown of players, units, or teams from Sunday's games. Feel it or fuck it is our instant verdict on the fantasy value of a player or situation, not the ability, effort, or character of the player. This is just how two old-timers in this industry talk when they got a lot of cover in a little time. Good morning, Matt Walvin. It's Monday. Uh, we're heading into week 11, and there were some interesting developments in week 10. Uh, generally speaking, feeling week 10, was it kind of an enjoyable week of football? Fuck yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That so, Vikings-Bills game was off the chart. Yeah, man, it was it was awesome. But let's we'll get to that one maybe. I don't know. But there wasn't much to really say about that game. I mean, are we really going to say fuck it to Josh Allen because he threw some interceptions? No. Probably not. I'm going to say, Josh Allen, when your elbows hurt, quit leading, like, trying to make plays when you're, like, tackle guys and things. Uh, Josh, you're not a linebacker. You're a quarterback. Yeah, you kind of love it, hated about that with behave. him. Behave. Yes. Yeah, yes. But, uh, yeah, we're telling you to behave. What a, your birthday yesterday, and we're telling <laughs> you to be, and we're telling you're telling people to behave? I am. It's you're telling, bad. yeah, fuck that. So, how about Matt Ryan? Now that he's back, <laughs> are you feeling that, or was it just a <laughs> Raiders thing? Feel that. Fuck, you know, just fuck the Colts in general, right? So, I mean, like, it was a great game. I'm going to be fine with some of the pieces, and, you know, we'll get to those, but, you know, Generally speaking, I don't want to hang my hat too much on a single game. I do think, you know, he's better than Sam Ellinger, right? I mean, he just yes. is. He's a better player. But experience alone gives you that. So, um, and I think he's going to, you know, make – he adds value to some of the other pieces that maybe will be forced to play as we go through the rest of the season. But but generally speaking, fuck the Colts. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. I, I'd say – just the idea of that passing game being a multi-dimensional um, unit that's going to be on the level of anything remotely like Tua or even the right. Cowboys, even the Cowboys. Right. You know, I would say, yeah, fuck that. So, but but what about Jonathan Taylor? Now that he's back again, the Raiders kind of a weak unit. But are you feeling him at all? Yeah, I am. I'm not. I'm not seeing. You know, so. Look, it's not been great all year there, but it's been great at times this year, week one in particular. I don't think the offensive line is going to get fixed all season long. Jeff Saturday, go at it, young man, but I don't think he can fix it. Uh, So, but I never say fuck it to volume, right? Because volume begats big plays and big plays are, you know, are part of this whole thing. So, so I'm going to keep playing Jonathan Taylor based on the volume and hope for a little more of it with no Naheem Hines. I'm feeling it with Jonathan Taylor mainly because it doesn't matter with the opponent for me. It's the fact that he was able to show the lateral agility that people were worried that he might not have with that ankle injury. Um, so that tells me that he's at least healthy enough that at least for another few games, I'm feeling it um, until we'll see whether the ankle gets better or just slowly deteriorates. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with that. And so let's throw uh, Paris Campbell into the Colts equation here. Go ahead, Matt. I'm feeling it because of volume. I just think that he, uh, for the same reasons you mentioned, he's going to get most of that volume on schemed plays. You know, there's no real schemed plays for Michael Pittman. It's more like you're a big boy. We can we can find you one on one. The rest of the the offense is basically piecemeal. Depends on what week they're going to use which tight end. Um, so good luck guessing on that. And then you know Taylor's going to get the most looks. But after that. It really is Campbell in the mix of screen passes. Certain They do about three or four different types of screens, probably some design run plays for him, and then occasionally some deep work too. So I And what he does after the catch is strong. So I feel good about Paris Campbell as maybe a wide receiver three in your fantasy units. But, what, but Michael Pittman, to me, it was fuck that. I'm not, I, I know he's going to have some good weeks. But I just don't think he's reliable based on what the offense is offering this year, not his talent. Yeah, and I'll throw him in the basket of wide receiver threes as well with some potential upside in a given week with more volume. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw Paris Campbell at the tail end of that basket if you if you're in a pinch. I'll throw him in there as well. I don't know if you know. I feel like I'm going to say I think Pittman's volume is going to be a little more reliable over the course of time. Uh, but that the Paris Campbell's going to have games in there where, like this week, where he was the the lead piece. See, fuck that. I think I think Paris Campbell is 
Paris Campbell is Stop what it. people think they're seeing when they when they look at Michael Pittman. And Stop it. Yeah, and it's, it's <laughs> the whole branding well, thing. I, I want to say, I want to say for, for Paris Campbell, like, you know, over the course of his career, every time he talks to someone who covers the Colts, they will rave without doubt about his playmaking abilities, what the coaching staff thinks of him, all these things. He's had, like, incredibly bad luck. Uh, yeah. with the injury, car accidents, weird fractures, all kinds of different things that have kept him from playing. So uh, I'm I'm intrigued, but but not sold. There like you go. You are. Well, are yeah. you? Yeah, let's see, there you go. Are you, but are you sold on Christian Watson after a three touchdown outburst against the Cowboys this weekend? I'm sold on that three touchdown outburst, but beyond that, fuck it. Uh, you know, the, the drops <laughs> were still a thing. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I hate to be totally dismissive of a player who has a role in, playing alongside Aaron Rodgers, but I think expecting that level of production consistently is obviously a reach to three touchdowns. But a viable play, sure, he'll be that. I'll say this. I, I think he's a viable play for sure. He's not yet on a level where you're going to compare him with any of the top 15 to 20 receivers in the NFL. But this was the crazy thing about watching that game is that he, Aaron Rodgers' expression said it all. It was like when he... When he mistracked some balls and had some drops, Aaron Rodgers is looking at him like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And then when he can't, makes the big play, the look on his face is like, I knew you could fucking do this. Like, I've watched you do this a million times in practice. It's like, there, that's the guy I see. Like, you can tell that, like, that's the look on his face. Like, finally... Like the guy I'm seeing is actually making the plays, and I'm I think totally feeling Aaron Rodgers' body language. By the way, throughout the course of entire, you know, he's career. a truth teller. Go, going yeah. back to his, the draft day, right? I mean, yeah. we, you know, just from from then on, he, say, you know, he there's yeah. no secret about what he's thinking. Say what you moment. say. I'm I'm good with people who show you where they stand, and I and I'm okay with the truth teller, even if it's <laughs> even if his, even I don't like the truth. Even if you don't like the truth, I'm okay with that, and I. And long term, yeah, I'm on the Christian Watson train. Yeah, long term and, for sure. And short term, I would take a chance on him. I'm feeling him. Fuck yeah. So, Kadarius Tony though, Mister, I'm going to adjust my gloves before I high point a ball. Um, after I, while I'm running a route that's got a double move to it. Uh, feel him long term. Fuck him short term. Uh, you know, was this McCole Hardman missing? Was this you know? I, I don't know. You know, I've i i I'm still. I'm still trusting the fantasy analysis of Patrick Mahomes, who has let us know that you're going to have a hard time identifying who's that, you know, that lead piece is, is going to be any given week. Uh, but, but let's say going forward, if McCole Hardman's injury is an ongoing issue, and it may be, I know Andy Reid said last week they were evaluating it further before they ruled them out. And we'll see Juju Smith-Schuster. I think that's his third documented concussion, right, that he had. Yeah. So, I mean, opportunity is going to matter here so feeling it if the opportunity is 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 as open as it could be and uh and otherwise kind of like i throw him in the basket with the rest of these wide receivers although look clearly the upside there any given moment is going to be incredible because he's an amazing athlete but i i you know i'm still not totally trusting uh canary's tony it, i'm feeling that he's a he's a hoard if you're hoarding luxury picks and you don't have a specific need that you have to target with your waiver wire then go ahead and take a, make him your high priority pick just from the standpoint sure. that with Schuster out and Hardman out, he got those mm -hmm. opportunities. Now, I'm not sure he would have gotten as many opportunities if it was just him playing the Hardman role. Now, he still would have probably gotten the touch the touchdown that he had, but there were a couple of plays there that might they might have depended on him a little bit more than they they intended to um, based on how it happened in the game. So feeling it, but but if you need something else and there's a better player available to make that fit, don't fuck it. Um, Wandale Robinson, though, are you feeling him? Everyone Let's go back to Kadarius Tony. Fuck Wandale Robinson. Like, you know, all due respect to everyone who wants him to have a great role. And I think the Giants are among them. They're just not there yet. And it reminds me of something I said about this offense going into the season. I thought it would be better. I think being measurably better, like, over the top better it's that's going to be a process and it's it is the process has started this offense is getting better it's going to be a long time before it's good and right now it's dependent on one player that player is not Wandale Robinson let me tell you something Wandale Robinson isn't wasn't as good coming out as Tavon Austin was coming out but he's just in a better offense but not as good of a player 
So yeah, fuck that as a from a fantasy standpoint. I the the love for Robinson just confuses me. He doesn't know how to position himself to catch the ball. I think that there's some thing, you know, to be a primary guy. He can be a piece of the puzzle, but he is not like the cent the focal point of could that. be worse. He could be Kenny Galladay. That could be a lot worse. That's true. Oh, yeah, well, but Kenny's getting paid in his second contract. <laughs> so you might like that. But then again, at the same I time... Like, if, uh, I want to say $500,000 $500, a target this past but, week. But, would, but, but I'll ask you this. Do you, would, you rather, would you rather be paid what you're worth or would you rather have to deal with imposter syndrome and be paid? I don't know. I mean, that depends on your, your mindset, you know, at the end of the if day. If I'm making so. $500,000 a target, I don't care what you call it. See, there you go. See, there's a pragmatist if if I know one. So how about Julio Jones? <clears throat> Feeling him for exactly what he is, a late season piece. The, the, the Buccaneers have been hoarding this and, and marshalling their resources for the late season, and he's going to be a piece of that. Uh, not a consistent weekly producer, I don't think. Uh, but you know, without you know, without Gronk, there needs he he can kind of fill a little bit of a void. I know he's never been a big red zone threat. But he's a bigger body that kind of gives somebody Tom Brady someone to look for downfield that isn't named uh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, and you know, those other pieces are going to get looks. And 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 as we head into the week, especially like when you head into you know the late season when the, the, you got the sixteen by, I mean, there's going to be a lot going on there. Uh, I'm not letting go of them in rosters where I have them. I'm not feeling them, but I'm not fucking them either. Well, let me let me put it to you this way because I know that it was just your sixteenth birthday and you're just a wee youngster in this NFL game, but. But I remember back in, in the 70s and 80s when we'd watch football and guys would run and you'd see, you know what I mean, you'd see that little like, <laughs> you know, bobbing of the, the body because the hamstring was bad or the ankle was bad or the knee was bad. And they're able to run close to full speed, but you can see the laboring going on there. Like they're really digging in to, to make sure they've got that stability, at least with one of the two legs that they're using. Julio Jones has a little bit of that to his gait. Um, so I, I'm feeling it for as long as he can stay healthy. The problem is, is that he's the type of guy for the past four years, he has like five big plays and a half and then he's gone. Or he's he gets hurt in the second quarter and isn't back till the fourth. Now it used to be that he was the main thing going, so he would still end up being a top fantasy producer. I'm not so sure this time around. So if but they I, don't need him to be right, I mean, that's the don't. thing. He's just an Larry Pete. Yeah. He's a, I'm feeling him as a football player and a wide receiver. Still when he's healthy, he still looks like Julio Jones. The problem is, is that fuck the idea that he's going to be four quarter Julio Jones game after game. I think he's more 1.75 quarter Julio Jones and fuck that. Rashad Matt White. Wallman hates Julio Jones. That's the headline. That's the headline. That's it. He left Atlanta and, you know, and I'm such a big Atlanta Falcons fan. You know, yeah, if you know me, you know that in case. So how about Rashad White? <laughs> uh, feeling him, feeling a Jeff Wilson Jr. vibe, uh, you know, and so as a Leonard Fournette manager, investor, I'm going to welcome myself to the Raheem Mostert Investor Club. You know, it just feels like <laughs> feels like that. You know, that we've seen the ship sailing a little bit, but I don't. I don't think you know whatever I feel for Rashad White, and I do think the momentum's building. He's gaining traction, clearly. Um, whatever I feel about him, I think now we have two assets in this backfield we can play, and that's a, that's good news. I think generally speaking, well, it would be good news in an offense that averaged more than eighteen points a game that it was averaging prior to this week. <sighs> I really don't know, Bob. This is one that I really don't know. Feel it or fuck it, because I I want to say feeling them both or fuck it both, in in this in those in this case. But Rashad White's, you know, he had one play where he actually looked like the player that he needed to become, um, and then there were some plays that I wondered about with him. Leonard Fournette is a is still a polished football player and still a polished runner. He just doesn't have the flashy jump cuts that people like. Um, so, he ran hard yesterday. Yeah, he did run hard yesterday. And what happens when you hard. don't start? Yeah, that's true too. But <laughs> I'll tell you this: he's always been good at accelerating in the contact, and very few running backs in this era do that still in the league. And he's one of them. But I'll I'll say feeling it for both at this point, just because that offensive line did play well yesterday, and it was a 
that I think that's a sign of things to come, but I'm always afraid to say that when it comes to offensive line play and um, a team like the Seattle Seahawks defense, which has been okay. Up and down. But they're up and down, yeah. So what about Donovan Beeples-Jones? Are you feeling, feeling it? Feeling it. Get out of my way, Matt Wallman. Feeling it. I'm getting, you know, look, this has kind of been, it's kind of been a, a, a slow build, right? A, yeah. You know, and in the last month, he's kind of come on pretty strong. I, I don't know that, you know, we're going to expect the target shares, he, you know, he got yesterday against Miami, but I expect a pretty robust environment. We'll see if the quarterback change that's coming here in a few weeks uh, works in anybody's favor. I don't know that it will because uh, I haven't seen that guy play for a while. And I have seen, you know, last time I did see him play in the preseason, Deshaun Watson, it wasn't that great. So, um, so you know, but honestly, as Jacoby said, is, you know, also not that great. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, I'm feeling Donovan Peoples-Jones kind of emerging as a, as a legitimate weapon. Maybe this is coincidental with David Njoku's absence to some degree, but not totally, right? It's his his rise, his yeah. ascendance started pre- predated his, that injury. So yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it too, and I think that what you're also going to see is Deshaun um, Watson, if he plays close to what he did before all of this, then you're going to see some plays that are off structure where Donovan Peoples-Jones gets behind the defense and winds up getting a little bit of that Will Fuller role. Or even if he winds up with maybe, say, the, the, the Andre Hopkins role, six of one, half dozen of the other, if it comes to the level of production, if it's if it's um, one of them is going to have those long, um, long developing routes that work deep and across the field. And I would imagine that's more Donovan Peoples Jones than it will be um, Coop, um, Cooper, because Cooper will probably be the guy that the defense is key on with the actual, you know, vertical route that is not as long developing. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Kate, Damn it. Yeah. Making sense. No, yeah, yeah. It's Monday. It's, we don't need all that fucking sense right now, but that's okay. Kate Otten, does he make any sense to you? He doesn't make sense to our buddy Dwayne. Dwayne's like <laughs> pouring beers out for him right now from what I see. Uh, feeling him as a large, as a another molecule in that large universe of tight ends that nobody wants to play but can play if they have to and hope they get a touchdown and also fuck all those guys. Uh, give me Travis Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that you sum that up well. He's playing well. He played well. He's just not getting a lot of targets. But the targets he's getting are high leverage. He's looking good. You know, it's kind of between Dwayne McFarlane and, and Greg Cosell, I laugh. Like, I've been touting Otten for a while. But, like, Greg Cosell this week was like, oh, Kate Otten's kind of coming on. You know, he looks like a guy that's helping the middle of the field. I saw him on Ross Tucker on a little tidbit of, Ross's stuff that said that but then you have Dwayne going well he didn't have enough opportunities really and it looks like that's getting sucked up but I'm going to say this I'm feeling him as an end of the bench player um, right. in a league for exactly the reason you're saying because if you're going to say <laughs> fuck Julio Jones for his him and his 1.75 quarter average um, per game then somebody's got to get targeted in the middle of the field and that's going to be on Ryan Fair Tannehill point. it's a trap uh, <laughs> um, great two touchdown performance. Kudos to Ryan Tannehill. Um, viable, feeling him as a second quarterback in two quarterback leagues, as I have all along, uh, with not a ton of upside. I mean, he does have a little running upside, I suppose. I mean, you know, when he's fully healthy, which I don't think he's quite fully healthy yet. Uh, so feeling him as is that. You know, I don't want to go over. I'm. I almost want to be a smart ass and say I'm feeling him as the slot receiver, the all um, Big Twelve slot receiver that he was, but not necessarily the quarterback. But I liked him as a quarterback prospect. It's just the the times have changed, and he's yeah. That I'm fuck it. Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, feeling him as uh, Jarek McKinnon's caddy, the caddy the rest of the season. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean. Like, I feel, I want to say the, the yes, I'm, I want to be all in on a starting running back for this explosive offense. And to that, to, to the degree that I can be, I am. And where I may have him on rosters, I'll play him as the starter. But temper your expectations. This is going to continue to be a committee. I don't know that he's going to be the lead piece. I don't know that, you know, we've seen the last of Clyde edwards Lair, although, you know, recent evidence suggests that that's, you know, that he is, uh, you, you know, on the way he's, on, yeah. he's definitely the odd man out at the moment uh, in terms of playing time. 
But again, Jarek McKinnon was the guy they leaned on heavily as they headed into the playoffs last year. He's trusted by Andy Reid clearly, and uh, and so that's that's going to be a fly, at least a fly in the ointment, maybe like a June bug in the ointment, uh, given the snap shares the last two weeks. Yeah, they're hoping that Isaiah Pacheco can continue to grab this role and not let go of it. And the offensive line is helping him out a lot up front. They did a great job against the Jaguars of really opening creases in the middle of the field. Um, but Pacheco is still one game removed from like bouncing plays that he had no business bouncing outside and just making mistakes that you would you would criticize him for maybe even in high school for some of his decision making. So it's it's kind of shaky. He's exciting. He's exciting to people who like to see all the flashy moves um, and and like high level of movement. But you you know in terms of decision making, it's still kind of not quite there. So. If you have them, keep rolling with them, at least as maybe a bye week contributor. I think he's, I'm feeling him for that. Otherwise, I'm, I wouldn't be like breaking the bank to try and go get him. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Kyron Williams, though, there, that's where you're breaking the bank, right? Oh, wait. I'm, he's right. I'm, I might be breaking the bank My over bad. somebody's head for suggesting that. That's all My I bad. can say. There we go. Yeah. It's the Rams. Fuck the Rams rushing attack. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all things Rams related, uh, offensively speaking. Uh, and that Payton commercial would he, he's the only the one who's, yeah he's the only one who speaks louder than i do in um <laughs> you know in a commercial i mean you think he's got one of those like bullhorns <laughs> as he's talking on that on whatever commercial that was i don't know whether it's a soup commercial or a or a water commercial or, well, a, commercial or a male Charlotte enhancement Day. commercial or i don't know whatever it was it was it was something what what about um what about he was just so loud that's all i could hear was how about Colt McCoy? Feeling him as a veteran quarterback who actually runs an offense the, the, maybe the way it should be run. I'm <laughs> so di- fucking diplomatic. I don't know what's. I, I don't know what to say about you. Right it's old age, right? I mean, just like I mean, he you know he he seemed to execute the offense how it should be executed, and uh, and I know I'm and, I, and I'm not saying Kyler Murray doesn't, but my feeling is Kyler Murray doesn't based on what I saw from Colt McCoy. Yes, it's kind of more of a fuck Kyler Murray long term than it is a feeling Colt McCoy short term. Right, nobody feels Colt McCoy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mac, what was his name? The the I can't remember Mac's last name. The head coach for North Carolina right now was feeling him back when he was at Texas, but that's that might be the only one. Um, how about Elijah Mitchell? Are you feeling that? Oh yes, feeling it so much. Uh, you know, one of those pieces like. I, once I acquire something, I I am loath. I don't want to say I'm a hoarder. Fuck that. I'm not a hoarder. Uh, well, maybe a little bit of a hoarder. But when I have players, when's the last free- time you've had those drinks back there? Let me ask you that. I don't drink. Okay. See and look. Okay. Okay. My, um, I rest my so, case. So, <laughs> so I want to say, like, like all the every league where I drafted Elijah Mitchell and I drafted a lot of Elijah Mitchell, I hung on to him. I said, I'm not letting go. Even when the, you know, in the dark moments. Post the McCaffrey trade, I was really worried. Like I don't know what the norm is going to be week in, week out, but clearly he's still part of the plan. So feeling him as part of the plan and hoping it's a robust part of the plan and it's a it's another uh, timeshare because I think Christian McCaffrey can still make out with uh, with a little less work and still get me some touchdowns on occasion. And I'd like a little production from Elijah Mitchell. It's a quote Tom Cruise from the movie Collateral where he plays that assassin in L.A. <laughs> I didn't push him out the window. He just fell out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking about for uh, for old Kyle Shanahan because I was asked a couple of weeks ago on the Audible, what what happens? What do you think of this trade? I said, all I know is if Kyle Shanahan manages to screw this up by not giving the ball to the best players on the field because he's he's too enamored with his own offense, I might have to drive out to San Francisco. <laughs> so that's I, you know or i actually i said fly mm. D- fly or drive you can you can check those two terminals i won't be i won't be on the highways and i won't be driving and probably won't be at the train station either but anyway <laughs> <laughs> but w- we will get the job done somehow um, um deandre swift i uh, fuck him um so <laughs> as the as the lions clearly have uh decided you know Look, it's not so much the Jamal Williams, you know, workload this week. It was the Justin Jackson workload. Uh, and yes. the fact that DeAndre Swift was off the injury report and was bitching, pissing, and moaning 
about his uh, lack of workload. You thought if there was going to be a course correction week or maybe like a little bit of a, the squeaky wheel was going to work in his favor, did not happen. Didn't even come close. It anti-happened. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is as much the Colts sending a message. Also, the fact that they won this game probably doesn't work in his favor. Yeah, fuck it. I don't think he's still, I still don't think he's healthy enough. And the Lions aren't really all that forthcoming. They don't have a, they have a history like the Patriots with their forthcoming um, nature with injuries. So I think it's a little more serious and he's just trying to get it out because Swift is one of those guys who's like. Deuce Daly's been in his ear all year saying, you got to know the difference between pain and injury, kid. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so he's trying to do, it's only a flesh wound thing, but maybe it's worse than what it is. So. How about David Montgomery on the other side uh, of the ball? Uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, feeling him as uh, more so. Uh, like, look, I don't want to sit here and root for Khalil Herbert to be hurt worse than he needs to be hurt, right? But Khalil Herbert is hurt to some degree, and so uh, David Montgomery, the more shares he get, the more work he gets, the happier I will be. Uh, but clearly, if Khalil Herbert is is you know healthy, he is again a player that they would like to see more out of. And uh, so not to the point where I'm a fuck David Montgomery, uh, but I'm definitely not going to feel him. I mean, he's going to be a, a, a piece that I'm going to be using because I have to. Fuck that you had to pick him as an early running back too. That's kind yeah, of the go. situation. Fair, fair yeah, point. yeah. That's kind of, that's where I'd be. I was like, oh, fuck me for having that, for me making that pick if I, you know, in certain leagues or having him in a dynasty league and turning down a Khalil Herbert trade or something like that. Um, Cole Komet, though? It's another uh, trap, but I kind of want to get caught. Um, <laughs> you know, like, again, it's the tight end position is more of the issue here. And, I mean, you know, don't like to chase touchdowns, but touchdowns happen. And when they continue to happen, uh, maybe there's a little more to it than we want. You know, there, there's just some players that have an affinity for scoring, and we've seen it. I don't think this is a pass-first offense. You'll be surprised to learn, Matt Waldman. What? And so it's, it's going to be a pretty narrow band of opportunities, generally speaking. But again, this is more about the overall situation uh, tight end in the NFL, or from a fantasy perspective at least. When you have a guy who's uh, showing a little bit of an inclination to put the ball in the end zone, and you're looking at a, a, a whole menu of players who might or might not score any given week, one that has a little bit is a little more appealing than those who don't. When you run and you have play action, the tight end is like chocolate to chocolate and peanut butter, you know, with play action in the tight end. So I'm totally about it. And as Adam Harstead would say on our film and data show last week, that when you have players who haven't scored touchdowns for a long period of time, they're due based on the number of, um, there's a range of number Kevin of Singletary touches or targets. You. Yeah, see, there you go. So I would look at uh, Colm Komet and feel like he's due and he's a function of this offense in the red zone and also on play action for big plays. Totally feeling it. Um, Terrace Marshall, let's end on his note. Are you feeling him? Uh, just feeling Matt Waldman's tweet of two years ago on draft night, steal of the draft, uh, and uh, also feeling the fact that he landed in the worst possible spot for a steal of the draft. And I don't think that's changing because they're going back to Baker Mayfield this week. Yeah. Not sure that's going to work in his favor. Uh, but but I look, I, I talented players sometimes get trapped in horrible situations. And I think this is the case for Terrace Marshall Jr. And, and sorry for his... Uh, fantasy fortunes over the course of his career but barring a, a change major changes this is not going to be a different outcome for him any given week feeling his talent but fuck that situation when you've got a quarterback who's head button people without a helmet and um you know and not even starting but he feels like he needs to get some attention because he the jones for that buzz is just like that media buzz he's just like jonesing for that and this week he'll have the helmet on when he does the head butting you think he will well, I think he will. He's going to be on the field. He's going to be playing. He's starting. That's true. He might. That's true. He better. Well, you get a penalty. Yeah. DJ Moore can tell him something about this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Well, listen. Happy birthday, my friend. Thank you. Love you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.